you were almost the first guy in Australia who I saw who was pushing boundaries. It felt like Australian TV was very safe. And then you'd see John Saffron on TV and you knew that something mischievous or something was yeah, going to happen. Have, yeah, people have told me that, that they're watching one of my stories and it's like it's a wide shot mm. of like whatever, a Hindu temple or whatever. And then like you see me walking into <laughs> shop and they're already like like kind of falling into the crack of their couch. <laughs> like, no, no, no. But I don't know. But it, also I think um, back then like, – being kind of a bit countercultural and trying to be cheeky and things was sort of in this unspoken way considered progressive. Okay. Even, even if the actual – there was not, nothing literal about <laughs> the politics really, like like where it's like, oh, well, yes, he's uh, I'm trying to make a statement about Marxism or something like that. And, and like if you look at something like the early episodes, seasons of The Simpsons, it was like that. I remember because I was there first time around. It was like – Considered a progressive show, mm. and it was, but you watch it now, and it's like, well, what, what's, it, it, yeah, it, it's not like they're kind of, yeah, again, like you know, talk, trying to push some left wing agenda. It was just that, it, uh, progressive pe- people were like considered like fun if you were willing to kind of be cheeky and you weren't uptight. Like being uptight and not cheeky, that was like the church. That was like, you know, George Bush's team and, you know, these uptight Christians and these uptight right-wingers who just can't laugh at themselves and can't laugh or whatever like that. And so, yeah, back then if you were just cheeky, you were, you were progressive <laughs> by default. But, yeah, like the backdrop to the world's changed a bit now. So, Yeah, why do you think that's changed? Why do you think the people on the left are often now the ones who are seen as uptight and the conservative ones are seen as being more loose and more free speechy? I don't, I don't know if like overall um, the conservatives are kind of fun and free speech, <laughs> <laughs> but but it, no, it is but it is true um, in some ways where because I, I, I like I wrote a book uh, called Depends What You Mean by Extremists and looking into the far right and so I had to like look into that world and 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 I, I'm, like most people in that world are, like, just annoying and, not, not, I mean, you know, I'm, hey, I'm not having a go at you Nazis. <laughs> listen, I don't want to, listen, can I, just, can I just back off from that? I don't want to, like, be judging anyone, you're a Nazi or whatever. But like, but it was sort of depressing that, and again, like, most of them are just normal and flat and, you know, whatever. But but th- there is sort of, like, amongst the Nazi, like, the far right, there were well, there was this thing where they would make fun of themselves and it was like depressing to me. I'd be going, how come they're making fun of themselves more than like on the on the late night comedy shows which hosted by all those people, mm. you know, that we all know, all the famous ones. Yeah, yeah. And it's like why don't they – like you could, I guess I would, it was just like weird for me. And I guess that's another change where there used to be in the same way that if there's genuine, it's really healthy to have a bit of personal self-deprecation mm. and like, and it'd be genuine. It's just healthy because like, why wouldn't we? Like we're, we're flawed. Mm. So it's like the most normal thing and it's kind of unhealthy not to have, have a little bit of self-deprecation because what are you saying then? What It's like, it's because you must be wrong mm. because you have flaws. And I think they're, they're, it's also healthy to have a cultural self-deprecation and um, that's like gone away. Like, if you look at, like, if you look, if, for instance, if you look at early seasons of The Simpsons, they like way more make fun of the left and sort of like, you know, like with a, when I say make, like examine the sort of like the contradictions and how everything's not smooth. Um, you know, even with like Lisa Simpson, how she's like an activist and then like, but because she's an activist, it means she has blinds and whatever. And it's like really funny or whatever. But, I'm telling you, back then, no, that show was considered like a totally left wing show, and left wing people loved it. No one, no one was like, what, what, what you're saying? If you're an activist on the left, there's things, there's foibles that can be sort of like made fun of. Like everyone used to love being roasted back then. Yeah, and I don't know what's happened. Like even um, I, I had this show called John Safran versus God. And it'd have like these segments where I'd go out in the, in the world and like look at religions or whatever. But in between them I'd have these little um, 
pieces to camera, like where I'm sitting there on this um, big lounge chair is almost like I'm, I don't know, I'm Satan? I don't know what the hell I am. <laughs> but anyway, and you, you know, and my whole shtick for that, and I remember just doing it because I just, I didn't think about it. I just thought it was funny, like, because, um, and I, because I, I, I used to do, because I wasn't on TV before I was on TV. Right? Yeah, so I yeah. Didn't think about that, but I did notice that, like, when you're on TV, you you're, especially in Australia, you're, you're always meant to be like really, like, um, like play everything down and really like be gentle with your audience. <laughs> and then if you like attacked anyone, it was like always not attacking. It was always like attacking, like how idiotic are they, like the other mm. or whatever. And you know, so if you're on the left, always hassling the right, or if you're on the right, always hassling the left or whatever. And I just thought it was funny to, to go on and just like insult my own audience. <laughs> but like, but they got it. They got it. It was like, it was like, um, you smelled those people's underwear on that show. Do you remember that? Uh, no, but what I'm saying is <laughs> that like back then, I, yeah. like, I did this show where like there was so much jokes about um, how, you know, we're very self-satisfied on the left. And okay. we always think we got, we're right and stuff like that. Yes. And, and, but did it in a funny way, not mm. in a, this heavy-handed whiny way I'm saying now. And no one thought it, everyone just thought that's, yeah, that's great. Yeah, mm. everyone loved the roast back then. And everyone like was flattered where it was like, oh, oh we're getting roasted. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's all changed. No one likes a roast these days. It's very weird. Like I don't get it at all. I don't because it's like it just seems so obvious to me that it's funny mm -hmm. and entertaining both having a bit of personal self-deprecation and also having cultural self-deprecation for whatever kind of your – whatever team you're on. I see that at stand-up gigs. So often when people do crowd work, often there'll be some crowd members who want to participate. But then if you um, talk to a crowd member and they don't want to be talked to, they won't give you anything to bounce off. I think people are very afraid of being deprecated publicly. And I don't know why that's happened more recently. Because I feel like even before the pandemic, when I started doing stand-up in 2018, it was a big thing like heckler versus comedian on oh, YouTube. Yeah. And like hecklers almost wanted to be part of the show. But now I think people are terrified of going viral because everything's being filmed. You know, yeah, like yeah. when you do a set at whatever venue, like last week at Comedy Republic, they filmed the whole thing and the audience knows it's being filmed. And they know that if they say something or a comedian accosts them and they say something silly, it'll go on TikTok and it'll be 2 million views and their boss will see it. So I think maybe that's part yeah, of it, it you know? It's so weird. It is like we're living in, um, what's it, Stasi land or something like yeah. in Germany where the, our phone cameras are like just waiting to catch something. Catch someone. I'm really hoping that just peters out. Like, like uh, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling yeah. you this thing. There's, we always think we're at the end of history. Like we always think <laughs> yeah. how things are now is how they're always going to be. True. And just, Despite my uh, beautiful, youthful, oil of Uland skin, <laughs> I'm actually I'm, I'm very, I'm very old, and so I've like lived through total like plot twists in the backdrop of the world. <laughs> What's the biggest one? Oh, uh, definitely. Like, what, the, it used to be that evangelical Christians, yeah. like so around um, the George Bush presidencies, and even even when like uh, like Bill Clinton was a president, even though he was a Democrat, it was like the. Um, Evangelical Christians, American evangelical Christians, um, uh, uh, what is it, ran the roost? What's the expression? Uh, of, of, of like culture. And so, yeah. for instance, they would whine. They'd go, oh, listen, we found this T-shirt in Walmart that's got the rainbow colours on it. We found this, you know, oh, this thing with Mickey Mouse and he's got the rainbow. And it's like Walmart or Disney World oh, and, and, and like the T-shirt <laughs> would be taken off the rack and, and stuff like that. <laughs> And uh, there, there were things like, uh, spe especially during, there, there were a couple of Iraq wars, but during one of the two ones, um, like, you know, you had to be, it was really scary not to be patriotic. So, for yes. instance, you had this, this band uh, called the Dixie Chicks who their uh, audience were country fans in America and they spoke out against George W. Bush or one of the George Bushes, I forget which one, and they got what would now be seen as cancelled and, like, you know, radio stations wouldn't play it or whatever and it's like – and, um, yeah, and obviously, like, it seems like the backdrop to the world's changed so much. Like, they um, – uh, and so, anyway, I've just seen, like, the backdrop to the world just totally change on, on a dime. Even more recently, I've been looking into things how the American um, kind of right-wing Christians in America who are, like um, – very worried about, 
you know, uh, LGBT things being introduced in schools and stuff like that. And they're forming bonds with conservative Muslim Americans. Mm. And it's like they're, they're, they're like a team now. Mm. And it's like, like after 9-11, it's like, the, like it was like, well, they're the two kind of against each other. And it's like if you were like a white Republican Christian in America, it's like there was no bigger villain than – you know, the hijab-wearing Muslim or whatever. But, like, you know, there's times moved on a bit or whatever and now they see there's, like, well, you know, we're both religious and we both mm. kind of have issues with progressive stuff and with LGBT stuff. And so, yeah, it's it, – yeah, the backdrop to the world just changes. Even freaking this week with, um, with things like uh, Kanye and Chappelle um, – yeah, as totally, a, totally normalized. They've just they've just thrown into the world. Like like imagine if you're like 18 or something like mm. that. You haven't heard about in in, in Australia or, or whatever. Probably even in America. Like you probably haven't even thought about Jewish people one way or the other. They like the, the, the chat. Like why would you? Like, whatever. And it's like he's Kanye West, this hugely um, influential cultural figure, and they, now Dave Chappelle mm. have like. Told a story about. I'm Jewish, by the way. If anyone watching this doesn't know, <laughs> they've like laid out a story about yeah. Jewish people. That's like makes us a target of like like there's goodies and baddies. You know, there's um you know um whatever like cis is bad, trans is good, black is good, white and, and like this this kind of whatever this simplify and it's like they've sold the story to young people that Jewish people are a problem. Mm. And so, and and that's like happened in the last two weeks. That the whole backdrop to the world of how people are going to see Jewish people has changed. So yeah, we're never at the end of history. So, with Dave Chappelle's monologue, have you watched it about Kanye yeah. West and the yeah. incident? Did you think that that was like as a Jewish man? Yes. Do you receive anti-Semitism when there's anti-Semitism discussed in the culture? Does that ripple towards you? Um, I kind of like. Depends. What, well, well, when it comes to his thing, I think there's like three layers to it. It's like, is he funny? And it's like, yes. Like, I think he's funny. And does he have a right to say it? It's like, yes. Right. And then, but then it comes to this third thing where it's like, well, what is he saying? And um, is it, I, I think the insidious thing about what he's saying is you can think what he's saying is kind of just casual and innocent. He's just whatever like that. But there's – it's highly suspicious. Like he put – like for instance, he was saying – he had a joke in there that was, um, oh, when you see a – when black people are together, it's a gang. Um, I got the quote. I can read yeah. it. He said, um, if they're black, then it's a gang. If they're Italian, it's a mob. But if they're Jewish, it's a coincidence and you should never speak about it. Yeah. So for instance in that – Amongst the uh, far right, the alt right, this whole thing of um, coincidence, like literally that word coincidence, mm. is this is is like a meme amongst the far right. Like it's like, um, it's like he what he said is like a far right meme where it's like oh oh just a coincidence. It must, uh, like like for instance, if <laughs> if there's like a left wing Jewish person who criticizes the right. Um, the right will kind of – one of their memes is like, oh, just say her name's J Jenny Weinberg or whatever. It's like, mm. oh, Jenny Weinberg, what a coincidence. Uh, like, another coincidence. <laughs> and so and so we're meant to believe that Dave Chappelle is spreading that and he doesn't know that – I don't know, it's just a bit suspicious. But, but I think with um, what he said from my perspective, I mean this is where it gets really tricky, is mm. it's – um, if I'm annoyed by what he said, it's more in the context of what's good for the goose should be good for the gander. And so it's like, oh, okay, if we're going to live in a world where you're just like doing that towards Jewish people, like I can deal with that. I've got a thick skin or whatever, but spread it around. You know what mm. I mean? And and so and, and I also really I really disagree with um, – what happened to Kanye being contextualised as Jewish power cracked down at him, mm. cracked down on him. And I'll tell you why. Uh, only a few years ago, Roseanne Barr, the Jewish-American comedian, yes. she had a top-rating um, show on television. It was like – and then she made um, some comments on Twitter 
against a black Michelle Obama, wasn't it? Oh no, it was another black politician okay. or, or a black politician, and and said something about um, Planet of the Apes or whatever. Right. Mm. Anyway, she got um, thrown off TV, mm. lost her show, whatever. So I consider, and and you, we and we could just bring up so many examples of things in the last five to seven years of people saying things that are inflammatory about identities, yeah. other people's identities, and the person just like being fired or whatever. So I just see what Kanye did in that world. Like it's like – and I just can't believe people are saying, well, I can't believe Kanye got – because of Jewish power he lost his job. It's like no, the background to the world at the moment, like with Roseanne Barr and like we could pick up like a, a dozen other examples, mm. is like um, – People do not like inflammatory stuff about identity or whatever. Yes. And so I, it, it's, it's just nothing to do with Jewish power. It's just like it's got to do with Kanye said wildly inflammatory things mm. and so it kind of it makes sense. Whether it's for better or for worse, mm. it's like it, it's just such – I find it I'm, – I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the, the concept of gaslighting. Mm. So I just find it like this the most wildest of gaslighting to be going – well, the, the, one of the big backdrops to the world for the past seven years is when people say inflammatory things against uh, black people or Muslims or trans people or gay people, or Jewish people, or, blah, or what, whoever, or Aboriginal, is like they've really got in big trouble, you know, and, and mm. faced kind of career consequences. But, but then when Kanye starts talking about Hitler and the Jews... When he gets loses his gig, that's because of Jewish power. Okay. Like, yeah. So I guess Dave Chappelle and Kanye, they're kind of alluding to, and they don't say explicitly, but they're saying that um, Jewish people are in charge of their contracts in Hollywood. So as mm. black men, they feel like they're on the whims of Jewish executives and that kind of thing. Yeah. So can can it be true that there are a lot of Jews in Hollywood, but it be not true that Jewish people are manipulating like African American performers? The well, to cover that in several ways. The first thing, I actually wrote a piece on my Substack. If you go to johnsaffran.substack.com um, about Kanye West. Okay. And he was talking about uh, his, uh, you know, like how Jews have just really screwing him over and stuff like that. And he actually on his Instagram page, he like was naming these uh, – Jewish bankers ah. from J.P. Morgan yeah. who, and he got booted off from J.P. Morgan. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I took all those names, every last name that he mentioned and uh, dug into them. Not one of them was Jewish. Wow. And, That's and, scary, isn't it? Yeah, and, and he's just – and so it, it's sort of like we're an archetype Jewish people where you're just going to project things onto or whatever. So there's that. So therefore like – Man, if this is going to be your shtick, as Kanye says, that Jewish people are screwing me, uh, screwing me over and Jewish bankers are screwing, Jesus, you better get your ducks in a row or whatever. You yes. get it right. And if the people aren't Man. Jewish bankers, then like suddenly it's like – suddenly uh, the goalposts would just be moved though. They'd, they'd, they'd go – mm. but um, I don't uh, – uh, I've noticed that people are very interested in – fields where Jews are and give the assumption that there's something wrong with that in comparison with other areas where they seem to not be interested in the backgrounds of people. So, for instance, just say you you believe in human rights and you're kind of against wars and because – and these freaking weapons manufacturers, they kind of, um, you know, they build these bombs and they kill – uh, drop things on black people. They all die overseas. Middle Easterners, brown people. Are like, what's a what's a religious background and the ethnic background of the head of Lockheed Martin, mm. of the head of Boeing, the head of like who who are, who are these people who are behind these companies? And then you find out that like, no one seems to be interested or concerned or whatever, mm. and or thinks and clearly by their actions of not knowing, seem to think that's not they don't care. And then it comes to. Um, oh, the people, there's an overrepresentation of people in the industry where they make Harry Potter films and Marvel films and, and Sylvester Stallone films and 
this this says something very worrying. Like, mm. why? Why does it say? Like, what's 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 wrong with being in um, the entertainment? It seems. Mm. Good. Also, the the other the other backstory to you're like, saying if it was Irish Americans and there's a bunch of Irish Americans and people wouldn't say, oh, it's a conspiracy. All the Irish Americans are in charge of the film yeah. industry and they're doing and, that. And also, it's like it just seems like really like looking at like unlike most Hollywood, isn't like lots of entertainment fairly benign if you know what mm. i mean like, yes like as like it, yeah like like the big the big things are the earners are marvel films and harry potter films and lord of the rings and stuff so that's what you, it's like and that's the jews <laughs> the jews are going around and they're reading these jr tolkien books and then they're casting people to be hobbits and like, when when will it end or whatever the, the other thing you have to know about like um, <laughs> the kind of industries Jews have got into historically, and I've yes. covered this a bit. I can't talk. To, not that I can't talk. To, it's just because it's going to be out in April, so it's too long away for me to whatever. But I've just um, finished filming a documentary for uh, SBS. Okay. On the history of Jews in Australia, so mm. the whole thing of like industries Jews have got into is sort of like addressed in that, or, and, or at the very least, I researched it and for the show, and. Jews were like uh, throughout history were like banned from certain trades, banned from certain industries. Like for instance, uh, yeah, like, like for instance, Jews came over to Australia. One of the reasons Jews came to Australia, like during the gold rush, was mm. because they were forbidden from all these um, trades in England. Okay, and so it's like the Jews. We're like, okay, fine. Like, we're let's go somewhere else. Mm. <laughs> and, and, and so, and so, th th there is quite a history of Jews being um, excluded, and then trying to making the best of it. Going, well, okay, if you're doing that, when we're going to do this. And I think I, I'd need to read more into it. But I think like the history of like why did Jews enter into the entertainment industry in America? I know one thing is that when they entered into it, it was a very low. It was considered like. A, a low status. Okay. Like, why would why would you be why would why would it, why would anyone with good um, with good kind of family background and with blue blood and all that you know why work would in we, the movies? Yeah, why would we work with that or whatever? And and Jews were excluded from and so I don't know. That seems pretty cool to me. It's like oh, so then um, uh, they turned it around and said, okay, fine, we'll do this thing that no one else wants to do, and then. Yeah, took advantage of it. So yeah, I find it, I find it, I find it like a weird example that the entertainment industry is um, like bad or something. Mm. Yeah, because then it's interesting. You could say like that the American government is controlled by like like you know Donald Trump's a German American, you yeah. know, and like everybody in there is kind of. Anglo-German white, but then if they were all like Jewish politicians and that would be a problem. So it's interesting that certain racial identities are like a red flag and then other racial identities are like, oh, this is normalised. These are the people who have always been in, in the White House. Like that's an interesting thing as well, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's also because with the contours of anti-Semitism is different to the contours of like anti-black racism and anti-Muslim racism. Mm. I'll give you like a, a quick example. Like when people are trying to make you – like hostile towards like Australian Muslims or Australian black people or whatever, they try they pitch the case that they're inferior to you. Like, you know, like, oh, they're lazy or whatever. Like they're, 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 they're lazy and they don't do things or whatever, and they're violent or whatever. And so the whole thing is they're inferior, right? And But when they're trying to pitch to you to like um, be hostile towards Jewish people, it's like it's this mind fuck <laughs> where they go, they're, 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 not, they're not saying they're inferior, they're saying they're, Superior. They're saying they're oh they're they're so smart and so <laughs> and so clever with what they do or whatever. So it's like in this like weird. It's so different. Like the con the main contour yes, is so different to the other forms of racism. And mm. then it becomes this mind mind mess in this modern world because the left tell us that it's not racism if you're punching up. And so then it becomes this thing like as we see like with Kanye and Dave Chappelle. It's like well I don't know they, aren't they punching up. They're, they're, and it's like, yeah, but they're, they're punching up, they're quote unquote, punching up by what they're doing is they're establishing the very stereotype and trying to normalize the very stereotype that sort of softened the path mm. to the freaking Holocaust. Mm. I mean, that's what, that's what, that's how um, the Nazis tried to get people on board with like why you should hate Jews. They were like, 
I mean, it was more complicated than this because I think they were saying they were rats as well. But but a lot of it was, li- listen, they're sort of the Jews are above you and that's what, you, that's what you've really got to worry about. Mm. So that's, yeah, yeah so it's very, um, um, yeah, the contours of anti-Semitism are different to the contours of other forms of racism and in summing up, yeah, and, it's, and, and, and I find it really frustrating that the left have really pitched this idea of what is like racism is privilege plus power or, or, and all this and, and it's not racism if it's punching up. It's like, man, when you start setting up those wobbly like fluid terms, mm. suddenly anti-Semitism doesn't fit into it and it's like how can you have a discussion about racism in history or even in the freaking present day and kind of go, oh, but parking to one side the, 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 Jewish, the Jewish thing, all other forms of racism. Did you feel anti-Semitism in Australian entertainment? Nah, I mean, I'm trying. I'm trying to think. There's, there is. I th- I think I've got a lot of permission. I think a lot of things that I've said, I get a pass because, I because I'm trying to be a comedian and an entertainer first. So whenever, I, whenever I'm like even writing one of my books or whatever, like I, I'm always thinking of like, oh, how do I make it funny or whatever. Like, like I think if I said the stuff I said, but straight as a like in a slightly more whiny way, or if I was like just on Twitter, mm. just be like, oh, shut up, you know, like, mm. th- like you do feel like it, um, things are a bit conditional. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's all cool, and but just don't complain about anything. Okay, like the, the and and also, it's not so much no no, I, I, but having said that, like I don't I don't think in it like. Like I, I don't think it, there's there's like some equivalence of what's happening in America as happening in Australia or yeah. whatever, and there's like some so oh okay if who's the Kanye of Australia and you know all that kind of <laughs> stuff I don't think it's worked like that yeah but there's definitely um, uh, there's a lot of infuriating gaslighting going on okay where, yeah where it's like um, I cannot believe you think I shouldn't draw attention to this and. Uh, and uh, yeah, because because people know to code their anti-Jewish sentiments in sort of woke ways and stuff like that. Like for instance, um, they'll talk about how like, and, and there's always like this kind of slight level of like like with all sorts sorts of bigotry. There's always this like plausible deniability and slight padding to kind of like oh what, what, what's wrong? I'm just asking questions or whatever. Um, so, so there's definitely – they definitely do that about Jewish people. First of all, I'll tell you what I mean about plausible deniability. Yeah. It's like, you know, like if Paul, when Pauline Hanson, because she did it, mm. she dresses up in a hijab mm. and uh, a burqa mm. and she goes into parliament. Yeah. And then it's like she can just go, um, oh, what's wrong? What, you can't wear what you want in Australia? What, what's wrong? And it's like, oh, what's wrong? You're not allowed to, uh, we're not allowed to ask questions about – or, uh, and the hijab, or, or, or what's wrong? Like, 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 oh, what? We don't have freedom to, uh, blah, blah. And, and like, like, she can just like have all these plausible deniability where she's just going, oh, I just wanted to ask questions about the hijab. I mean, that's mm. what Amnesty International does when they're talking about what's happening in Iran. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> God, like, you know, like she can just, <laughs> and, and it's like, yeah, like, and, and it's like bullshit. Like, okay, fine. We, if you're going to play that game, Paul, well, like, we can't prove it. Mm. Like, I can't, we can't prove it, but we know. Mm. We freaking know what you're trying to do yeah. is like roll up animosity towards Australian Muslim people. Like, mm. So similarly, when you're Jewish, you have all these freaking gaslighting things where they can all act kind of um, innocent. Like, like the big one that they do is try to pretend there's nothing specific about Jews and the history of Jews and racism and our culture and present day race and just flatten us as like white people. So it's like, oh, yes, there has to be a discussion about uh, racism. But uh, obviously, like, like uh, yeah, like, and just the Jews are excluded from it yeah. because in this kind of plausible deniability, just like fucking what Pauline Hanson does, of yeah. like, like, oh, why would you be part of this conversation? Um, it's not a conversation for white people. Mm. And, and, and it, so you just get all this sleazy gaslighting. It's weird. I did a um, podcast of Bob Catter and he said something which uh, struck me. It's interesting that some of those politicians who are conservative and what they think about non-conservative people, like when he found out that I was a stand-up comedian in Melbourne, yeah. he said that um, that stand-up comedians in Melbourne, they focus on the identity first and then the funny second. Yeah. 
which I thought was interesting in that conservative people think that progressives have that identity kind of placating who they really are uh, internally. Do you think that's true? Like, do you think that in uh, art and entertainment, often people put their identity first? Because I do some, I sometimes see that at comedy gigs where someone will say, hey, I'm this, and then the crowd cheers, or I'm this and the crowd cheers, and then they start, it's almost like an ingratiating way to the audience to show, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm one of you, I'm, I'm this. Do you think that exists or not? Yeah, I guess so. But, I mean, just with all of art, it just really just comes down to, like, is it funny or not? Is it working creatively or not? I mean, that's how I'd see it. So, uh, and and I think one of the problems we've talked about all this stuff around art is that, like, most people just aren't, and most, you know, most books, most songs, most comedians, most shows or whatever aren't going to be, like, the most brilliant thing ever created. They're, mm. they're, they're, they're going to be, like... Most most things are just going to be flawed, <laughs> just and, fine, <laughs> and, and therefore it's like it just becomes complicated. Like, um, like, like I want to stand out. I got nothing wrong with this ideal ideologically, but like, I'm not sure it's brilliant or whatever. Yes, so, yes, yeah. I, I mean, I I just say like I just in my stuff I don't do it that way. I, I'm, and and when I've occasionally slipped up and done it that way, I've always freaking regretted it. Um. Mm. I, and I've only really not done it that way once, and I've I've frequently frequently regretted it. I, I I just you think about it before you go to sleep. Sometimes <laughs> I have that. Yeah, yeah. I, I just find <laughs> generally, like for instance, I'm really good at. I, I don't whine online, for instance. Yeah. Like I always think, and maybe, and I like I always think, how do I frame this in a way that a person reading it will think, oh, okay. That's a joke as well as what he's trying to say, mm. or whatever. And that's that's really um, uh, steered me well. Mm. Before I ask you about puff piece, I'm just going to make sure that these cameras are all good. The only um, like alt right interaction I've had is doing a podcast with Andrew Bogart and seeing him, the NBA player, yeah. because he kind of associates with that. He he showed me a message in his phone, and it was all these people who were like. It's kind of celebrity-ish yeah. and they were all in like a coalition against like against like the lockdowns and against that freedom stuff. And it was really interesting to see in that group that there were a lot of like different miscellaneous people and some of them were from, from, from far right groups, some of them were not. But like it's interesting that that's almost like an Australian <laughs> Illuminati where these people have like 500,000 Twitter followers will say, all right, we're posting today about Dan Andrews and this is how we're going to do wow. it. Like that's a targeted... Um, thing and when I was saying that to him, he didn't really realize that because he was conspiratorial. He's like, the government's trying to take us down. I was like, yeah. but you're in a coalition of twenty people who have like an enormous reach. It'd probably be like a couple million all up on social media, and uh, he he was dumbfounded by that <laughs> kind of rebuttal. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting in the sense that you've been in media for a long time. Do you think that there's like a level of delusion in like uh, Australian media personalities or like even sports stars? Because I've found that as I've met more and more people going up. Like they don't know how influential they are. Yes. Yeah, I mean there is that kind of – yeah, there's a total I, – I guess with lots of people on all sides there's this – people are very aware of the, the faults in others and how they might be manipulating yeah. things, but they, they don't see it in themselves. Because Dave Chappelle, even going back to that, he wouldn't think that if someone said, you know, that could lead to anti-Semitism, he'd be like, I'm just on comedy. I'm just on stand-up. You know, yeah. I'm just on a stage of a mic. Yeah. And they don't realise that it ripples <laughs> through the rest of society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find that so strange when that happens. And I think, as I said, I think particularly with him, the, like the reason I'd want to speak about him is because I think most people are really naive about and for good reasons, like, 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 I, I don't. I, I think there's so many people amongst the mainstream, in, amongst the set, that just don't think about Jews one way or the other. Yes, yes. And so, and so, that's why it's important that if he's going to put out that, that, there should be people who kind of go, well, listen, you should know, he's what what he's saying might just sound like, kind of like, why not? Mm. But a, a, actually, we've got to look at it a bit more deeply and. Uh, 
Um, but, but I found myself almost like I, I'm. I'm just like my background is Irish Australian. Yeah. You know, it's like it's it's not. I've never been uh, persecuted or you know had anything bad happen to me based on my race. And watching Dave Chappelle and Kanye, I found myself going like, "Wait, are there Jews control? Like, it's a yeah, weird yeah. thing where you've got to check yourself and be like, yeah, yeah. Do, "What is that true? What they're yeah. saying?" And so you know, and that's someone who's got you know I've got an undergraduate degree in philosophy. I feel like I can sometimes discern ideas, but I was even kind of checking. My myself and going and it, so it was rubbing off on me in a way just yeah. seeing a comedian who I enjoy and a musician you know who I, who I grew up with who was one of yeah. the biggest artists of all time when they tell you that there are Jews in the media yeah. that's definitely going to embed in people's minds even if subconsciously oh yeah I mean totally and but what, one thing that um where I've had like a different experience to most people through my books and my docos where I've had to like spend time with these different groups, like with the far right, for instance, and their anti-Muslim sentiment, or even anti, like Aboriginal sentiment, mm. or it, w- what happens is they always say things that has like some connective tissue to something that, if it was phrased in another way, it would be like, okay, fine. I mean, the Pauline Hanson hijab thing is a, like the, a classic example. Is mm. like, well, right now at the moment you have. Amnesty International type people saying, oh, in, in Iran there's an important dis- discussion around how the the hijab, sh- should women be forced to wear it or not? Are they forced to wear it? Blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, so well, what, what's wrong with One Nation? What's wrong with um, the United Patriots Front marching through the streets with their flags and marching mm. on mosques and blah, blah? And so it's like it's, so they always try to mess with your head mm. because – Everything's got this like connective tissue um, to something in some way that in an other context um, it'd be like fine if if you had a responsible conversation that looked at things more broadly and didn't just focus exclusively on that but looked at sort of like how women are forced to dress or not in other in situations. It's like anyway. So what what, what th- that's what that's what the kind of the mind trick that like Chappelle and um, Kanye are doing like they're. It's like, okay, fine, you can have a conversation about contracts mm. in Hollywood or something like that. Like, fine, yeah. But, yeah, like I, I find it, like, like to give you, give you an example, I find, I find it very difficult to believe that the contracts in Hollywood compared with the contracts of the workers at freaking iPhone factories in China you know, like, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like as, soon as, as soon as you kind of go, oh, but well, there's probably like quite a bit of exploitation more generally or whatever. And mm. that's not what about her. That's just sort of like seeing they're particularly trying to make the point that mm. that if there's some jerk um, who's a Jewish lawyer, yes, like that, that's got meaning and that's mm. got meaning in his background. It's like, well, seeing you're bothering to bring that up. Well, no, I'm going to bring up all the other examples where uh, I reckon it goes a bit further, including the fact that none of – Kanye's bankers that he mentioned were actually Jewish. Were Jewish. The the other thing with with um, Kanye, which I because you know people are going, oh, he's just mad, he's crazy or whatever. He's very selectively crazy, I've noticed. And like one thing he did, <laughs> he put out this um, letter about him getting fired from J P Morgan Bank, mm. an actual letter. It was, it was a real letter. Uh, and then saying, we do not want to work with you anymore. Please get um, take your banking elsewhere. And he put it out after he was getting in trouble for saying anti-Jewish things. So therefore it was like, oh, well, just prove his point, hey, mm. prove his point. But yeah. very, very selectively crazy Kanye, he can't control himself or whatever, had very conveniently cropped off the date of the letter. Ah. Because as soon as the date of the letter was there, it was like a month old or three weeks old and it had to do with the fact it came exactly after he posted the names of – J.P. Morgan executives online. So as soon as it becomes – and started whining about them on his Instagram. So as soon as it becomes that, it's like, oh, okay, um, so you posted the names of all these people from J.P. Morgan on bank and mm. saying all this uh, stuff about them. And so they sent you a letter mm. saying, okay, bank elsewhere. That's very different to – and as soon as he said something about the Jews <laughs> <laughs> the very next day. So, so yeah, I, his whole – obviously um, – you know, I'm not saying he's mentally healthy, but mm. it, it, I, I don't know. It, it's he, it's very selective in what he's kind of goes crazy about. A, a, a comparison might be: I've heard people say 
um, if you've got a guy who's like um, beating up uh, a, a woman and um, I'm thinking of a particular celebrity but I won't name him mm. or whatever – um, but but the, I, uh, he also was – there was all this talk about, oh, he just can't control himself. He's got this yeah, mental I know who you're problem about. Where, he can't, where he can't control himself. And mm. it's like – and people are like, oh, isn't it very interesting that he somehow can seem to control himself around men who are taller and yes. bigger than him. He's like, he selectively has this mental problem mm. where it's just, it's just around like when there's someone with a smaller frame than him. Yes. Uh, I, I kind of feel like a bit like – that in another area with Kanye where it's, it's, it's very interesting what what he sort of can't control himself because of his mental illness and what he can control himself. Let's talk about your book, Puff Piece. So it's yeah. about uh, the big tobacco industry. No, no. <coughs> Shortlisted, <coughs> which is okay. why I'm here. Yes. Shortlisted. I saw that this morning. Yeah, recently. The Prime Minister's Literary I know, award. huge. So that's good. <laughs> you might meet Albo. Is that how it works? Well, I'm like, a, I, I, I'm, this is bringing me into being a respectable member <laughs> of the community. <laughs> I just kind of feel like I feel like kind of a bit bitter, like I'm like bitter and twisted about the counterculture. And, yes, you know, and you're becoming mainstream. Well, no, no, I'm bitter about them. <laughs> like uh, with their whole like Jews are white, so you shouldn't be part of a conversation about race. So it's like okay, okay I'm joining. I'm, I'm going to try to join the freaking respectable part <laughs> of society. So this is part of my plan to start yeah. being countercultural and part of the fringe and and, and just. Start going to like maybe after this I'll get invited to maybe something at literary the, events the Melbourne Cup yeah maybe. you'd be in the bird's cage yeah. with Hamish and Andy yeah <laughs> and I might and also who knows what other kind of like events that like mm. the, the, our political elite go to true it's probably like a version of like that island that secret would you island. sell out what what do you mean would I sell? this is why <laughs> this is why I don't sell out yes it's because. Unfortunately, this is I've got this like valve that makes me unable to sell out. I'll tell you what it is. Yes. Is I don't have – there's a market. There's both a market mm. in the public mm. and also a market amongst the people who green light things like a, at a television network or at a book company or whatever for this – for the version of me that's the one you – that I put my books out under and whatever. There's, mm. a, there's a market for that. Yes. There's no market – for this other version of me. Okay. So, and I, and I know people and I've got nothing against them. I know people like, for instance, because I um, used to do uh, the breakfasts on Triple R. Yes. I, I spent a lot of time at Triple R, this community radio station. And I saw how there were like people there who were there and then they were able to, you know, they were able to be like a fringe uh, counterculture stand-up comedians. <laughs> yes. On one day, but then sort of like go to one of the mainstream stations and do ah. breakfast radio or whatever and be really good at it. Yeah, yeah. And, or whatever. And they could have those two things or whatever. Mm. But can you imagine? I would never. It's tough. Yeah, but I don't, I don't even know. Even if I wanted to. Yeah. I wouldn't know how to do You couldn't it. be on Nova. Yeah. And every time. And every time. <laughs> and I really try. I can't. I can barely be on an ABC panel show. Okay. There's something about me that like whatever that thing is, that <laughs> magic thing that. People like Will Anderson have where, yeah. where they can just sort of like be warm mm. and, and sort of like get – like I have to struggle so hard. Like I, I think I kind of crack under the pressure too early like where I, I'm like, <laughs> oh, hang on, this isn't fair. How come you're like warm to Will Anderson and not to me? <laughs> and, in, and I don't know what it is. Yeah. Even though if I say that now f- to you, mm. that sounds like, oh, why don't you do that as your shtick? It doesn't, that doesn't work as my shtick. Okay. Like, me having a meltdown. Are you friends of these guys? Because when I view John Saffron, I think of, like I put you in that category of okay. like the best comedians in Australia. Mm-hmm. So when you're meeting like Will Anderson, yeah. or I'm not sure if you met Hamish Danny, yeah. do they go, John, we're in the group or what yeah. happens? Or do they go, oh, it's, it's Saffron. What, are you, what happens? Yeah, no, it's not hostile at all. Okay. <laughs> it's I, don't, just I just love it behind the scenes, Hamish, and any awful no, yeah, to you. But they're not really like, but it's not, it's not like, it's uh, not like, oh my God, we were going to be friends, but then mm. we had a fight. It's just like, you know, like your life goes a certain way. So yes. I have, like my friend is Jeremy, who I play, my friend who I play Scrabble with, okay. as opposed to hanging out with um, them. <laughs> yeah. But not in a bad way. <laughs> you're just I'm in different worlds. Out with them. If you're listening, Hamish and Andy. Could you take Jeremy to the bird's nest at the Melbourne Cup? Yeah. I reckon I could. Yeah. The um, the but I did, I did go to Will Anderson's 
uh, place in Los Angeles. Okay. I was there and I did his podcast. Cool. Yeah. Which was, um, you know, professional like this one. Yeah. So that was fun. So, <laughs> yeah, like we drinks do, around us. <laughs> we, 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 we do I used to do, I've kind of changed now because I'm, I'm old. This is how I've matured. Mm. I, th- this is how I've always got into trouble is that um, part of my shtick being that I like talk about um, like things like friends and my f- my dad and yes. an ex girlfriend and stuff like that, and I and I'd always like, and you sort of like create these sort of realities that sort of are like my distorted view on what happened, like mm. my but but kind of the audience is aware, like that's a joke, like if you know what I mean. So that always worked, and people seem to love that. And then I started stretching it to like people like I actually don't know. <laughs> so for instance, I did, like I was once on <laughs> Triple J or something like that. And I was talking, I just m- totally made up this story. I don't even, one of the people I made it up, it was a, it was a local comedian. Okay. And I thought it was actually kind of funny what I did and not mm. at all controversial, but he was really annoyed because it's like, and I thought it was like so clear that I was taking the mickey. So it was like, <laughs> it was a particular comedian who's. You know him well? No, 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 I didn't know him. Okay. Like I didn't know him. I, yeah. I might have met him out or whatever <laughs> like that, So, but I didn't know him right. Uh-huh. And I told this story that – and he's got a really – as he is because he's a very nice person, mm. a very gentle person and that's his his reputation and his image because it's accurate. Mm. And so I happened to – in the real world I did happen to meet him one night at this um, uh, like this nightclub and then and then it, and then what happened was like – and I was there with this girl and then he was talking to – Whatever, and it was like totally nothing. It was like mm. benign nothing, right? Yeah. Then for some reason, <laughs> I was on some something like Tom Ballard's podcast or something <laughs> like that, and I start telling this story about how oh he um you know, I was at this club and yeah. I, I was with this girl, and then he sort of like like he tries to act like really you know like but the, and he just he just swans on in, mm. starts talking to my woman, and so like I start telling this thing like I'm you like, start like a rap beef yeah, yeah, with yeah. another comedian. Well, I tried to like present him as this sort of like this uh, uh, chauvinistic cad, not not chauvinistic. Okay. I thought in like in a good way as, ah, as like a he's a stud, yeah, he's an stud alpha, an alpha, alpha male. As, like he's like Andrew Tate or whatever. Yeah, I tried to present him like that, and yes. I thought, and first of all, I just thought. It, it, like there was no malice behind mm. it. Second of all, I just thought clearly this is um, like satire will, will be taken as a joke by everyone. Like, <laughs> but yeah, then I met him at this party. He was so upset, and um, wow. it was really and he and also he's such a nice person. I must have been in the wrong because he's a nice person, and also he wouldn't want a confrontation. So for him, to, that's when I realised that. So I, I try not to do that anymore. Yeah, it's tough. So he approached you one on one. And said, I heard your little comments on the podcast. Yeah, and it was, re- and I just thought that the mistake I made, and, that, and that's happened a couple of times where I do the shtick yeah. with people I kind of know. Yes. And like tell these stories that are mm. clear, but they, they know it's a <laughs> troll or whatever. And then, but then you do it with someone you don't know, and they kind of, and, and anyway, mm. the other thing you're like, Will Anderson, he wasn't upset with me, but I mm. said something about him um, where, again, it, it was just like, Pretending there was some sort of like Hollywood style beef or something. Like I just said something on air where I was just being an idiot and he and he was nice. He kind of, he goes, oh, John, I hope you don't think I think that of you and stuff like that. And, then, and that's when I realised like, and I said, no, I was just joking. I just made up the whole thing <laughs> or whatever. And, um, and then, yeah. So burning now bridges. I try not to do that. Now I try, even, this is how good I am now yeah. that um, Mark Fennell. Okay. You know him. It rings a bell, but I don't know him. <laughs> the, um, he uh, he hosts these shows on um, SB- SBS, like uh, what what the British stole, and he does these podcasts. Oh, yeah, does all these shows or whatever. Yeah. So he'd posted something a, a, ni- a nice thing. He'd posted this thing of um, he's reviewing these uh, podcasts, and one was this special I did or whatever, and he's saying something. Flattering, and then I thought, oh, I'm going to write some like little cheeky little saffron thing in response, or whatever. <laughs> and I checked with him beforehand. I slid into his DM nice. and I said, "Can I post this?" Even though it was like it, it wasn't at all controversial, I just said, mm. "I just said, oh, it's courteous." Yeah, courteous. It so saves your back as yeah, well. Yeah, you won't now, get approached at a party in a bathroom. Like, it's just not the hill I want to die on. Like I don't mind dying on the hill of doing a book on big tobacco. Yes, and vaping totally. Or getting lost in the far right. Like yeah. 
All this stuff, I'll, I'll die on those hills. But a local comedian. Like, it, it's just not, it's just sort of like, I, I would care more about not hurting their feelings. Than, mm. It's than, unnecessary conflict probably. Yeah, and also, and also once you kind of put out a lot, like a lot of stuff, you start not getting so precious that like every last thing has to, like, like, like even like when I write a book, I'll like write a chap, like, like a chapter or something. And then kind of go, oh, well, it's not really work here or whatever. Or like, it's be funny. It's funny, but it doesn't fit. And I just don't care. Like, and so that's a very healthy w- way to do rather than when I was younger, like being very, like, I've got this joke. <laughs> this joke has to get out there s- some way or whatever. Yeah. I learned a bit of that from Eminem mm. where I noticed his, <laughs> I noticed his like B-sides, like, and, yeah. then get off the, oh, and then he's like his collabs and then these, mm. and then he's like bootleg collabs that didn't even – had it were only leaked, were like often like your lines in that that were just so brilliant. I'm yeah. Like, that's such a – how is this not – how is this falling through the crowd? And then I just thought, oh, no, that's what you just do. You just kind of put out stuff and don't be so precious. Yeah. And sometimes some what, of your good stuff's not going to get out there. Why did you never do stand-up comedy or have you done stand-up comedy? No, I haven't done stand-up It's interesting because I always find that interesting in Australia when people uh, rise up a trajectory like you have. And, again, Hamish and Andy come to mind as an example. Yeah. When people don't start off in stand-up comedy. Yeah. And for some reason it really pisses off stand-up comedians when they um, surpass <laughs> – <laughs> when those people from outside stand up surpass the stand up comedians? Oh, yeah. I, I, there was no particular reason, just more like there's only 24 hours in a day, yes. days in a week. And Have you ever done and, it? And I did. No, I, I haven't ever done it. Okay. Although, interesting. I was just like more interested in this kind of ambiguous, not ambiguous, but sort of like stuff that's a bit kind of vague, not vaguer, but you know what I mean? Like where I'm not. I. I. Also, I think in stand-up comedy, there's unless you're like really so confident, and obviously like the the brilliant, the top ones are, and they can do that. Mm. It's much harder when to do what I kind of like to do, which is sort of like <laughs> troll your own audience. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, like for instance, just say with me and Father Bob, and we're on Triple J, right? Yeah. I remember people like saying to me, they going, "Oh, I just came across your radio show. I just didn't understand. I was like, what's going on here? It's like <laughs> these two people are like fighting, and then." <laughs> You're always insulting him and whatever. Mm. And then, and then like, uh, they got into the groove of it and mm. realised, like, oh, no, that's sort of, like, the fun or whatever. Mm. But, but yeah, yeah I, d- I just like that kind of thing where it's a bit more you're playing the long game and you're sort of, <laughs> yes. like, needling your audience a bit. And, and, and I, I think if probably I would have thought that, oh, if I do stand-up comedy, it's much, it's much more pressure to kind of get, get the laugh. Or, premise punchline, premise punchline. Yeah, yeah, like, I'll, I'll start feeling insecure if I don't. I, I mean, that's the same with... I think um, comedians online, how <laughs> it can be a problem that they want the instant pet on the head. Yes, yes. Like, like that's just so it's poison awful. chalice. Yeah, like it, it's like, oh, if I say Donald Trump is a cunt, or whatever, like mm. they'll get me a, a a thing, and it's not funny or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, but the algorithm rewards it. Yeah, and it's just, and and so I just think that leads to less of my style of comedy. Like, for mm. instance, like, my style of comedy is, like, is the old Colbert report. Yeah, that was and, great, And it's not it? the new uh, – and the old Col- – if you don't know, I, I can't believe – I'm so – like, Colbert, when, when we were young, there was a thing called the <laughs> Colbert report. And so it was this show where – and it was where Fox News had far more of a cultural mm, – Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, yeah, and so Fox News was, like, this big right-wing thing. It had lots of cultural power. I mean, it still does, but it's, back then it was, like, the big thing – and there was this show where Steve Colbert just played this Fox News, <laughs> like a faux Fox News yeah. kind of host. And the entire show, you have to watch it and almost and reverse everything he says mm. in your head. He did it to the point where I think some people, they did surveys and they thought that he was a conservative host yeah. in parts of America, which is amazing. Yeah, so I just like, I always liked that more. Not that I... And that, that was paired with the John Stewart show. Mm. And I actually always liked that more because that was more my style. Yeah. Where it's like you're kind of – well, you're granting the audience some freaking intelligence <laughs> that they understand what's going on. <laughs> and then it's just like – it's like just being cheeky and, and fun or whatever. So – and I think there's far less of that comedy now. And I, mm. I, I think part of it is because everyone's online and they need the the pet on the head mm. straight away in the form of the like rather than – which is fine. The long game. The, the long game, yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, I've fallen into that yeah, trap like me before. Me and Father Bob could not be 
do what we do, what we did on the radio show, like online, because it's like on TikTok or something. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you need an instant <laughs> pet on there. <laughs> and we, we yes. Anyway, uh, as I am actually, and I might need your guidance. Yes. <laughs> Um, I am ho- I'm doing something that's sort of comedy. Mm. Um, I'm hosting a, a multicultural comedy event. Okay. And I, I think I'm doing two or three of them. Yeah. And it's put up on from some comedy company. I, I, and I forget who the acts are or whatever. Mm. And um, I have to like introduce it, like do – and do I'm, – I'm like – Do type five at the top. Yeah, something like that. Like I yeah. said – because I said – I said, oh, like, listen, I don't know any comedy – <laughs> but, but I can tell like a story. Like I've done stuff before, like with my books, where I'm, like I've done a show. Yeah. Where it's like, but it's like more, and it's like funny. But it's like the expectation. It's not like I'm out there doing zing zing zing. Yeah. It's more like <laughs> me telling a story. But this, so I've really, I'm going to be freaking out. I, I took it on, um, and but yeah, I'm going to have to write a tight five at the start. And I think I'm going to talk about Kanye. So that's damn because I feel like that's I've got to think of something that's sort of like easy on the nose write. right now. No, but sort of like not too esoteric, like, mm. like because it's a multicultural thing. So they've got they've got yeah. me as the Jew because <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 they're sort of they're like you'll probably more, mention Kanye at like some point. They, they, they've got a lot to learn about um, <laughs> the, the bleeding edge kind yeah. of woke version of the left, where yes. it's like um, Jews are white and they're not mm. really part of that world anymore. But yeah. they, they, they haven't got that memo yet, so they, mm. they were like, "We need a Jew," and um, so they got me. And so, yeah, so I have to do something that's sort of like riffing off that. So I'm thinking Kanye, but you can tell I'm really I'm f- nervous about it. No, you'd be great. I think just your presence is funny. So I think just being on stage. You say that. No, you do have a very that. funny presence. I think in some contexts I do. I tell you what I get wrong. <laughs> I tell you what I, I just and, – and because I notice this in other people, the worst thing you can do as an entertainer – or not the worst, but one of the worst things – is to kind of overthink how everyone's against you – Okay. And then sort of make that your premise. Mm. And like, so so it's so hard because the audience isn't thinking what you're thinking <laughs> and, and you're also selling them the idea. Yeah. I remember, like, I, I, tell, I remember there was this Australian musician who I thought was like, and I won't name him because I don't want to. So do that again. Do that again. <laughs> do that again. <laughs> but anyway, he was like in a, 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 a cool um, band and stuff like that. And it, and it was at some. Uh, I was at some show. I think it was Women of Letters or whatever. Anyway, it was just like some show where like people got up and read stuff or whatever. And he got up and he starts going, well, yes. And he's pulling his face. I'm, 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 I can't follow it or whatever. Go, yes, yes. And um, he's getting all nervous. And, and I was trying to piece together what's going on here or whatever. And I realised he was thought everyone in the audience thinks he's like – a failure ah. because he like hasn't really uh, or something like some version of like he hasn't released a record in seven years and okay. the last one didn't sell as well as the other and like uh. i had to really pin this together that that <laughs> so his starting point was rather than us thinking like oh my god this guy i like it cool this guy's here <laughs> he's like we're all there in the and because most of the people in the audience they've just got like jobs at, a fr- mm. at banks and they're working at the 7 and 11. Yes, yes. And they're working at bars and they're working as accountants and at law firm. And they're like as if they're sitting there like thinking like. About his discography. Yeah, yeah and about <laughs> him going like, man, why, why hasn't he got his shit? You know, like, yeah. like no one was thinking it. Mm. And then he's also selling the idea that he's a loser. Yes. And then just to get to the point and, and like I feel like sometimes I this is what I've got to not do at this a multicultural comedy thing, <laughs> it's to kind of like get out there and go, oh, you, so you don't think I'm a proper comedian? <laughs> like, oh, oh, I get it. You think Jews are white. Why is a white person? <laughs> like I can't get I've got to be sort of like yeah. just people are happy to see me. Yes. Like, you've got to understand the reason I've got a right to be parent because I do have people who like a very small group who are, are out to get me. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whom? I don't want to get into it. Okay. But like who comedians? No. Oh, okay. So so it's easy for me, me to get par- paranoid. I once, mm. but I once uh, one of my favorite moments, like where I felt good, was I'd written my first book, which was a true crime called Murder in Mississippi, and I had mm. never written a book before. Can you imagine how like when you commit to writing a book? That's like <laughs> eighty thousand words. <laughs> yeah. And I hadn't read. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Okay. Right? 
And so it was so much stress writing this book and I was freaking out or whatever. And then on top of everything else, I won't say who it was, but it was someone in my, um, let's say extended family, mm. but like someone <laughs> who I knew would be reading the book and be out to get me. And I'm writing this whole book on top of all the pressure of writing this first book mm. and me not writing a book. On top of all that, I'm like imagining this one person who's got it in for me and what he's going to say. While he, you're typing the book. Yeah, while I'm typing the book. Ah. And I, I'm going through this insanity. I, I promise you I went through – it was I was so insane that I would – if I was like quoting a conversation <laughs> yes. like between me and the accused killer, mm. blah, 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 I, I'd be going, oh, he's going to be reading this and going, oh, he just cut and paste the conversation too much and like didn't put a lot of work in it and mm. blah, blah, blah. And like as if anyone would be reading this book <laughs> and like it would occur to them how much the qu- quoting was. Anyway, I, I wrote this whole then, – then I went to do a live show about the book or whatever. Mm. I was in front of a big crowd or whatever and I came out and everyone was clapping. And they were really happy. I could just tell they were really happy. I was like, happy to see you. I was like, how the hell did I just spend a year and a half <laughs> like writing the book with that guy on my shoulder mm. and not this room of people who are on my side? Yes. And it's like I, I – but it, it is very hard though because like people are out to get you. Some people would know you more as an author now than like your previous TV work, which yes. is interesting. You know, like best-selling yes. author. Yes. Lots of books out. This book recently, Puff Piece, which means you might meet Anthony Albanese, which would be cool, and then hang out on the islands and go to the Logies and yeah. Birdcage and that kind of thing. With Puff Piece, why shouldn't my generation vape? Because my friends around, yeah. like, I'm, I'm 26, yeah. and I notice even comedians especially, but just people generally around me, everybody's vaping since the pandemic. I think a lot of people had, like, anxiety, and they've used that yeah. nicotine hit as, like, a, an outlet. Why shouldn't we vape? Well... It's more you, you should be aware of, uh, like, you know, you should go in with um, the knowledge. And so one of the one of the little uh, sleight of hands or whatever is they draw attention to the danger it isn't, not the danger it is. So, I, so I'll give you – like, like, for instance, you know when there's, like, a product and it says it's, like, 98% fat-free but it's, like, 98% sugar. Yes. <laughs> and then the other one, it's like, it's 98% I love sugar, those snacks. It's 98% sugar free. Mm. It's like, oh, wow. It's good. But it's like, you know, 98% yeah. lard or whatever. <laughs> so the thing with vaping that you should be aware, one should be aware of yeah. is that they're, that they'll say things that are true. They'll say, like, for instance, uh, a vape doesn't generate smoke. Mm. And so that it doesn't good. generate tar. Okay. And so, so it is true that the most dangerous thing in a cigarette isn't in a vape. But in that, like the example I said to you, it, it's like you are inhaling into your lungs like these, uh, uh, what's it, propylene glycerol and these um, flavours. And, um, and, 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 and it's like I, I spoke to this doctor who said if you were just like inhaling like steam, like nothing else, like, it, it, it wouldn't take long before that, like that actually, like you, your body's not meant to be taking in mm. things like that. And so, um, yeah, it, it seems like a very small chance because like the research, like the research isn't fully in yet, but it seems like a small, quite a roll of the dice to think you can be huffing in these propylene glycerols and these flavours and all this other stuff into your respiratory system. And all day and night for the for the next ten years, and somehow for some reason that's not going to like oh we we've, we've actually found out that has no health consequences whatsoever, <laughs> and um yeah you, could, you you're still like putting stuff into your body, and I, I would <laughs> why do you think we're all vaping like why do you think it I can't think of someone who I know who doesn't vape and it kind of crept up like i was i didn't notice vaping and then all of a sudden everybody's vaping like you walk down brunswick yeah, street in fitzroy everybody's holding a vape it's like an aesthetic thing well i guess it, what do I, I mean what i guess you could say well there is nicotine in it right yes Generally. but it's oh, more than that it's more than that because then yeah. everyone would have just smoked but no smoking wasn't popular for my generation 
Yeah. Like they did a really good job with those smoking commercials with the person with a hole in the lung yeah. and they're just looking down the barrel. Like that really freaked me out. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people were freaked out by that and smoking wasn't seen as cool. Like my brother was smoke at school in Geelong, yeah. but he just, they'd be behind a smoker's tree. They'd have to do it in shame. Like they yeah. wouldn't do it out. Like people vaping in classrooms now. So I'm interested in why the aesthetic of vaping. I saw Dave and Chappelle's smoker vape during one of yeah, his. Yeah, he vapes. Yeah, yeah. One of his specials. So we can blame him for that too. <laughs> he, um, no, I, well, I, don't, I don't know. But yeah, that's the other thing about vapes that I can't believe I left out when I was saying what you're inhaling into yourself. And it is like nicotine as well. Mm. So, you, you, so, so you, you have to be thinking that oh, you can spend 10 years huffing day and night into your system, nicotine, propylene, glycerol, flavouring, and somehow that's not going to – Affect you. Yeah, it's not going to affect you. Yeah. So, it, it, and that seems like a big roll of the dice. I would say that, and and the the other thing that's a bit tricky that makes it different to cigarettes is you have, for instance, there's a reputable um, British uh, National Health. What are they called over in British? The National Health NHS. Yeah, that's right. The NHS, right? So there is a there is an argument, and done by a reputable body like that who say that if someone is addicted to cigarettes that this can be a, a way of weaning someone off cigarettes. But I, w- I would say it's, it's a totally different story. If someone was like, I'm addicted to cigarettes and I'm going to spend a year weaning myself off cigarettes with a vape mm. and then I'm going to be lowering the nicotine um, in the vape as I go on and then at the end of the year I'm going to put aside both cigarettes and vapes, then you can see – in that limited context that it is a kind of quote Success unquote story. health health device or whatever. Yeah. But then so that makes it also hard for, to argue against vapes because there's like these limited ways where you have a reputable body like the NHS saying, no, it, it can be used that way. And then, then it becomes this whole thing of it's not as dangerous as a cigarette, which is kind of like there's a bit of like comparing chalk and cheese a bit. Like it's a bit like, hang on, if I – nail this peg into my arm mm. that's not as dangerous as uh, i don't know shooting a bullet into my foot or, it's like okay um okay maybe it's like yes like, yes so so but it's yeah I, I i i'll just be very interested in um 10 years whether all these mm. people are going to be starting to um sue the and I have very powerful repercussions yeah. so let me get this because, right so mate, oh, oh, as, yeah. as all of this is about my ego of course so are we very happy to go, <laughs> go well, what, what I can I say? You. I tried to tell you. But I did also, I actually wrote wrote about this recently I because I smoked and I, I, I did, I'd never smoked for a sustained period before writing this book. Like, you know, I, I should say I, I would have smoked here. And I've done bad stuff. <coughs> so I don't, I don't want anyone to like be going through their Nokia card on their Nokia phone camera going, oh, I heard John saying he never smoked a cigarette. But hang on, when I pick up my Nokia phone card, <laughs> I've got him at this vice party <laughs> in 2004 <laughs> with a cigarette. But no, I'd never like smoked for a sustained period before. I yeah. never vaped. I didn't even really know what vaping, like I'd never thought about it. But then I did um, smoke and vape heavily over the, because I like to get immersed in things. Mm. And um, I think you were vaping at the party that I met you at, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, uh, yeah, I think yeah, maybe. Yeah, that would have been when I was writing the book, though. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I did suffer, um, uh, yeah, I, I, there was a, a, a cost. Mm. Where, it was a health scare, wasn't it? Yes. So, so yeah, so like like where, where, the, where the doctor just said to me, he goes, well, do you smoke? And I said, uh in funny you should ask that because I don't, but for the last year and a half, and he goes, oh, what the hell or whatever. Yeah, so I had, okay. a, I, I had quite a serious health scare and and the and the cardiologist did say he reckons me huffing, huffing cigarettes and vapes for a year nonstop was probably a straw that broke the camel's back. It's kind of like the guy who ate McDonald's every day to do the documentary on yes. it because like you wrote a book on um, vaping you vaped and smoked all the time yeah. and then you had a, a series of um, minor heart attacks. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. And then so was the outcome of that now you don't smoke or vape? Like was yeah, it scary? Yeah, no, I, I, stopped, I stopped straight away after handing in the book. Mm. Like which is just – Do you wish you didn't vape or smoke since having the heart attack? 
Yeah, of course. Like, well, well, I was trying to get it, to be honest, I was trying to get addicted because I thought it would be good for the storyline. Yeah. But then I, there was the other thing that was kind of annoying. I was never really getting addicted. <laughs> <laughs> Some people be so annoyed hearing that. <laughs> I know. But I was like, like for instance, I was trying to get addicted to vaping mm. and then it'd be like two weeks. And I was going, I haven't vaped for two weeks. <laughs> Um, where's my vape? And it was like I just left it like on the floor of the car or something. You know yes. what I mean? Like that's how much I was finding it really hard to get addicted no mm. matter how hard I tried. What was the scariest part of big tobacco industry you found? Like when you were writing the book, was there something that shocked you? Um, yeah, it was like how far they've got. So so Philip Morris were the Melbourne people. Yes. So they, they've put out this. It's not out in Australia yet, at least not legally. They've put out this kind of third product that's not quite a cigarette, not quite a vape, called a heat stick. and But it kind of is a, a cigarette. <laughs> but it, it, they really are messing with your head because what it is, it's a cigarette. So it's it's tobacco wrapped in paper with a filter at one end that you plant between your lips, inhaling nicotine and tobacco into your lungs. But they claim it's not a cigarette. Damn. And they say it's not a cigarette because you slide it into this device, which is you plug in so that they can kind of say, oh, it's an e-cigarette because you plug it into the wall or whatever. And this device, it, it heats up the, the heat stick, the tobacco, to an incredible degree but never actually lets it catch a light. So therefore they say because it hasn't caught a light, therefore this sort of thing that suspiciously looks a lot like smoke that is generated from it, because they, they, they say something has to be a light for it to create smoke and because this is only heating to an incredible degree, the tobacco, even though this thing's coming out of it that looks incredibly like smoke, it's not quite smoke. So therefore it's not smoke. Therefore it's not smoking and therefore it's not a cigarette. So they're basically just doing a new version of a cigarette and have figured out this like really sneaky way to – to sort of like fudge that it's not a cigarette. And to compare it with vaping, vaping doesn't have tobacco in it. So, and tobacco is what, um, when uh, quarter light generates like the smoke and the tar. So that, that so, so, so even if you're in favour of vapes and saying, well, a vape is healthier than a cigarette because it doesn't cre- create, contain tobacco and tar and smoke or whatever, it's like, well, this Philip Morris one, which they're sort of, trying to pretend is an e-cigarette, does have the tobacco in it. So um, and, the, and the way that they've sort of like been so successful in a limited way of just sneaking in this brand new cigarette, I, I, thought, I found incredible. Because they, they did it because cigarettes were getting banned. They did it for two reasons. So cigarettes are getting banned. So in Europe there's like menthol cigarette ban. do that. Do that. You got oh. a little thing there. You got it. You got it. Oh, yeah. 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 The menthol cigarette ban and um, – so all menthol cigarettes were banned and then they just introduced this new th- thing that they claim isn't a cigarette but is a cigarette and got away with it. And so wow. now you can get menthol he- heat sticks. So they see – Big Tobacco sees the future of their industry within the vaping world. Well, they in, think yeah, that the, – Yeah, kind of the, the e-cigarette world and they would – and because the other thing is that Philip Morris are doing is they, they see vaping as their competitor – Ah. And so they kind of want to own this post-cigarette world. So in their dream, and their dream has come true, I think, in either Japan or Korea. In in Japan or Korea, um, uh, vapes are banned, but this heat stick, well, they're legal. So that's like their dream situation. Okay. So in, in Philip Morris's head, they would love this to be the situation where it's like, um, hey, Australian government – Yes, we have to get past this, you know, we agree, no more cigarettes or whatever, and now we're going to be in a new world. But can you really trust all these hokey vape companies and all these shonky stuff coming from China that you don't even know what's in it or whatever? We're a reputable um, blue chip company with a Mm. great reputation. That's what they'd think. And so we should be the stewards of this new world. And so therefore, yes, um, heat sticks should be the the new like post-cigarette solution and yes we agree vapes should be banned because that's because that's their competition they'll because have the only product so they might potentially well, that, have that, that's what their dream would be wow. and their dream has come true i think it's I, I think it's japan it's either japan or korea their dream has come true where um vapes have, are not permitted but this heat stick is permitted 
And and because the other thing is when you're like a big company, like a, a shareholders, you have to have like an angle. And so the fact that their product has tobacco in it, that um, gives it a unique selling position that they can kind of, you know, tell shareholders like, oh, no, no, we've got this solution for the future. And um, all those vape companies, they're not going to be able to do it because this has got tobacco in it and stuff like that. Far out. That's scary, isn't it? Yeah, they're, they're really brilliant. They're, they're, they're so um, – got to respect their – Sneakiness. I always find that weird with like um, like hipsters in the sense that like when I first moved from Geelong to Melbourne for uni, I found that like a lot of hipsters would have this um, perceived morality, but then like they'd be getting ecstasy from drug dealers that were like exploiting an unbelievable amounts of communities. Yeah. And the same with vaping. I think like maybe if people were aware how bad big tobacco is and, and know with e-cigarettes, maybe people would from an ethical standpoint stop and it will become uncool because you support big tobacco by doing that i wonder if that's the way to get people off i doubt it would work because you just think like if that was worked like people wouldn't have iphones like everyone knows that true made in these factories with shit yes everything's bad isn't it yes. if you can't get around it no, um no I, I don't know well confession the what <laughs> just go to confession yes <laughs> Well, I've got to, I've got to, this is how unethical I am. I bought shares <laughs> to, um, to Philip Morris shares when yes. I started writing the book for two reasons. One, so I could get into like the shareholder conference calls and stuff. You know, wow. Shares. But then also, I also like the troll of like, you're reading the book and like, I, I, find, I throw in this complication that like, I'm like compromised <laughs> <by> my <laughs> shares. But it was really complicated to buy them because they're not, like, at least for someone with my brain. So, because is that they're not on the Australian stock exchange on the New York side, so mm. like, like scan documents and send it to the banks, and it was just it was so hard. I don't even know how I ended up doing it. My I, a friend of mine who knew about the stock, I did anyway. So, and my and my shares went quite well, and you know nice. whatever. And then the book's over, and I, surely I should pull out now. <laughs> the book's over, but not because I'm trying to be unethical, but I just can't motivate myself to go through the pain of getting all like trying to work out how to sell the shares mm. so i still have the philip morris shares. wow so and they're doing well when you're making money from them well i haven't checked it in a while so yeah I've got to, um, i'd be interested to see how they're doing i think yeah yeah i think they're doing better than um what's that cryptocurrency oh it's smashed isn't it yeah. it's crashed and the book's selling really well isn't it yeah my book's doing better than cryptocurrency <laughs> i can't believe all you people <laughs> Getting into cryptocurrency <laughs> and not into my book, <laughs> John. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed talking to you, and thank you. yeah, I respect you enormously. Oh, you know, no, it's you. it's I've yeah, I've always been a massive oh, fan, and really um, nice of you to say, I appreciate it. And um, it's cool that now you're an author. You know, I've never seen someone have so many incarnations of a career where you don't know where they're going to go next. Oh no, yeah, cool. What should I do next? Anyway, uh, we round up. Share market. We're rounding share. up. Yeah, no, share no, market. No, I only say that Stock because, because all my whenever I do like podcasts myself, I always <laughs> yeah. ruin them. By the endings. An end, it's end, hard to put a full stop on the end of something. Yeah, because it is. It's like the I, I'm just so painful, like watching those Lord of the Rings movies <laughs> in the in the theater where you like you think it's going to end. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like it well, you black. go for another twenty minutes now. Like like, oh my god! And then it fades up, and there's like a ship <laughs> on the horizon, and it slowly goes to the horizon, yeah. and then it's on the horizon, and it fades. To like, and you're like, this must be there. How can it not be the end? Fade up and then like there's some elves and hobbits in some <laughs> giant toadstool or whatever. And it just wouldn't end. Anyway, that's how – that's why I'm really bad at um, – yep, let's just yeah, – sorry. Sorry for ruining the end of your podcast. It's a good way to end. Go and buy a puff piece. Thank you. We're up. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs> awesome.